Okay, so welcome everyone to UCSF's Cardiology Grand Rounds. We are recording and streaming live to YouTube. I'm honored to be able to present today Dr. Aaron Bagish, who will be speaking to us on sports cardiology. Dr. Bagish is the founder and emeritus director of the Cardiovascular Performance Program at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. This was the nation's first program that provided comprehensive cardiovascular care to elite and recreational athletes. He is now professor of medicine at the University of Lausanne's Institute of Sports Science in Switzerland and chief of sports cardiology at Lausanne University Hospital. He has served as medical director for the Boston Marathon and as a team physician and consultant for numerous athletic organizations, including the World Anti-Doping Agency, FIFA, the NFL, the U.S. Olympic Paralympic Training Centers, college teams, and the New England Patriots. He has received funding from the NIH, the U.S. Department of Defense, the American College of Sports Medicine, and the NFL Players Association to study the effects of exercise on the cardiovascular system. He has published over 300 original peer-reviewed articles and served on multiple editorial teams, as well as guidelines and consensus committees. Welcome, Dr. Bagish. I'm excited to hear the talk. And if anyone has questions over the course of the talk, please just type them into the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of the talk. Or if you prefer to keep the questions anonymous, just direct message me in Zoom and I can ask them on your behalf at the end. Welcome, Dr. Bagish. All right. Well, first off, let me just express my appreciation for the invite to be with you. I've been looking forward to this. You may be asking why your speaker today is wearing a white polo shirt, and I can assure you it is not because I just came off the tennis court. This is actually the hospital-issued uniform that we, uh, we wear here in Switzerland. Whether it's good or not, from my perspective, the jury's still out. I'll get back to you at a later date, but it is what it is. So I'm gonna to talk to today about sports cardiology and share with you what I think uh, are the most important um, historical past progress points, and also spend the majority of the time really addressing what I see as the future challenges in the care of athletes and, and highly active people. So as mentioned, I have a bunch of affiliations. This is just for full transparency that I have financial connections with, as well as, as uh, funders that have been behind the work, some of which I'll show today and some of which I will not. So I wanna get everyone warmed up this afternoon with a, with a case. And if you've heard me speak in the past, you'll, you'll have seen this case because it's just too good not to use. This is a, not a patient of mine actually, but a, a prior training partner. He was a 30 year, 32 year old professional male marathoner who um, presented to the emergency room with fatigue and an acute pleuritic chest pain. Um, he was appropriately seen by an ED physician as well as a cardiology consultant, and he was diagnosed with viral myopericarditis. So a diagnosis that's certainly relevant in the ongoing era of COVID-19. He was prescribed NSAIDs and told to lay off the activity and uh, went home. Things went quite well. A couple months later, he had gotten back into training, and he emails his doctor, his cardiologist, and he says, Doc, all is well. I'm feeling good. I think the NSAIDs did the trick, and I'm hoping to PR at my next race. So for those of you that are athletes or spend any time around athletes, you'll recognize the acronym PR, which stands for personal record. This is a, a, an athlete reaching out to his doctor and asking for permission to push hard and to try to set a personal record in his next race. And the well-intending doctor writes back, racing again sounds fine. However, I prefer you take your medication orally, not PR. And the, re the reason I bring this case into most of my talks is it, it really illustrates the challenge in taking care of a patient population that you don't understand. When, when patients come to the clinic, whether it's because of a specific occupation or a specific ethnic background, they bring with them lingo dialogue expectations that if we as clinicians are not sensitive and responsive to, we set ourselves up for suboptimal provision of care. So in the world of sports and athletics, why historically have cardiovascular docs um, not done a service to this population? It's been because the old schema has really left us on the periphery. In the old days, the athlete was taken care of by the coach, the athletic trainer, and a sports medicine doc, who was usually a primary care person or a, an orthopedic surgeon. And we as cardiovascular specialists were really called in in isolated situations when there were difficult decisions to be made about eligibility or placement of the defibrillator. And, and while this may have worked okay for some period of time, it was suboptimal and set us up for situations like the one I just shared. 
This is important because the number of men and women in developed countries, and, and, and these are US data, so these should be, this should be familiar to most of you, um, suggest that the number of people that push their bodies hard at all age groups, whether we're talking about young high school or collegiate athletes, men and women in, in older age groups that go on and try to run road races, participate in triathlons, go to the CrossFit gym, that this population is growing uh, explosively. And so these men and women who are ostensibly healthy um, are out there. And one of the things I want to impress upon you is that no matter how much exercise someone does, it does not confer immunity from cardiovascular disease, and we need to be prepared to take care of them when they show up. So the new schema looks something more like this. It's gotten more complicated, but the good news is, is that this complexity now places the cardiovascular care provider in squarely in the care team. So coaches, trainers, sports medicine docs still incredibly relevant, but increasingly there are more stakeholders, administrators, family members, lawyers, agents, and medical subspecialists, including cardiologists. Um, the American College of Cardiology has been extremely sensitive to this paradigm shift. And just a little bit more than a decade ago, put together the sports and exercise member section. I had the opportunity to sit on the first advisory board of that. And this has been the most rapidly growing section within the college with now more than 4,000 members that pay dues to receive information from, from the Sports and Exercise Council. Um, I want to share with you a series of papers, uh, which we're not going to go into in any detail, but I want people to be aware that they're out there. So if there is relevance in your clinical practice, you know where to turn. The first was the white, the white paper that was put out by this initial sports cardiology um, advisory board, in which we really talked about cardiovascular specialists as members of the athlete healthcare team and addressed some important priorities and research and clinical objectives that needed to be met. The second was a revision of the so called Bethesda conference proceedings. This is a document that was adopted by both the AHA and the ACC to deal with the issue of eligibility among young athletes that present in clinic with cardiovascular diseases. And we'll talk about this document in a little more detail. The third was a partnership with the NCAA, in which they asked a number of us to come together to talk about what constitutes best cardiovascular care for student athletes. And this is a document that discusses the, the, the very controversial but important topic of screening, but more importantly, provides recommendations around the, the role of an emergency action plan when a catastrophe occurs. This was followed by the first ever international ECG criteria in which people from all over the world got together and tried to develop uh, criteria for the interpretation of the athlete's ECG, which as many of you know, can look very different from that of a, of a sedentary, otherwise healthy person. Next was the sports cardiology core curriculum, which was a document that was really designed to provide an educational framework to teach trainees and established providers who are interested in this, this patient population, the tools necessary to, to deal with uh, these people when they come to clinic. And then most recently, the, the first US-based imaging guidelines uh, that integrate multimodality imaging into the care of the athletic patient. So in 10 years time, uh, a, a lot of work has been done to move this field in the right direction. Um, as Leila mentioned in the introduction, um, I have spent the last 20 years in Boston, where my primary focus was to develop a sports cardiology program, in which we call the Cardiovascular Performance Program. I am no longer there, but it is in certainly very capable hands and alive and well. And the, the mission statement of this program, which is the, really the mission statement for sports cardiology in general, is to provide comprehensive world-class clinical care and research focusing on prevention, management, and performance enhancements for athletes and highly active individuals. Now, there are four basic pillars to a comprehensive sports cardiology program. There's the ability to provide pre-participation screening, which we see as a community service, not a revenue generator. There's the opportunity to provide consultation to the symptomatic athlete, the op opportunity to provide longitudinal care for those who are diagnosed with disease and are interested in figuring out how to both manage their disease, but also maintain high levels of activity. And then there's the opportunity to work in the performance enhancement space using lab-based testing to help athletes get faster and stronger and perform at higher levels. You know, so for this to work in a place like UCSF or Mass General, you really got to do two things. It's got to be in line with the clinical care goals and it's got to support research. So with respect to clinical care, it has to enhance the institutional mission and generate some money. And with respect to research, it hopefully brings in funding dollars and advances the science. Back in 2009 or eight, when we first started this program, this was the sports cardiology landscape in the United States in terms of programs. And what's exciting is that if you fast forward to where we are now, um, this is what it looks like. I'm, I'm not aware of, uh, of any really major tertiary or paternity care medical center in the country that doesn't have either a developed or a developing sports cardiology program. And I think this speaks to the fact that people understand the value that this brings to the overall cardiology service line. 
So these are the people that typically come into a sports cardiology program. They're people you might expect, team sport athletes, hockey players, lacrosse players, soccer players, but they're also people that value high levels of physical activity for occupational recreation. So firefighters, um, emergency medical service providers, people that simply want to get out and hike with their grandchildren on the weekend. And importantly, our definition of an athlete has always been anyone that places a high premium on physical activity, either for occupation or for recreation. And so in the short few slides I've presented so far, I've talked about progress, but to borrow a line from the famous Vermont poet, Robert Frost, I think we have miles to go before we sleep and there, there's a lot left to do. So what I wanna do is talk about two very specific patient populations and talk about several very specific challenges that remain. The first applies to young athletes. And, and what I wanna impress upon everyone is that we really don't yet understand the natural history of many of the key diseases that affect young people. And we really don't understand the risk benefit ratio of superimposing high intensity, high volume exercise on, on top of things like genetic cardiomyopathy or channelopathies. The second relates to older athletes. And this is where we talk about the issue of therapeutic decision-making. And what I, what I will show you later on in the talk is that although we figured out how to take care of a lot of common diseases in general cardiology, we have very, very limited primary data to guide clinical decision-making for these diseases in the sorts of population that I'm gonna talk about, which are master's athletes. So let's talk a little bit about eligibility, um, where we came from and where we need to go. Um, 40 years ago, roughly 40 years ago, a small group of people got together in what was now known as the 16th Bethesda Conference and generated the first el ever eligibility recommendation document. This document was basically a simple, straightforward document that said that if you have any form of cardiovascular disease, that your sport type should be limited to bowling, cricket, curling, golf, and rifle rate. So not a particularly huge choice for the 18-year-old man or woman diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or bicuspid aortic valve, an extremely restrictive approach. Um, fast forward to 2015, this is now the fourth iteration of the Bethesda Conference Proceedings. It's now no longer called that. It's called the GHA ACC Scientific Statement for Eligibility and Disqualification. And the document has come a long way. Um, this document is now a 15 task force paper that's organized by topics and diseases. It's a, it's a document that's really designed to talk about who, who to disqualify and who to permit to play sports. It's geared toward competitive athletes, so people that compete at the high school, collegiate, or professional level. And there are some important things about this document that you need to know. The first is this, this document still considers athletes to be limit, a limited control population. And that's one in which the question about whether these young men and women can make um, logical informed decisions for themselves based on the pressures to compete in sports. That's something I vehemently disagree with, but something that still ends up in this document. The second and probably the more important um, new thing in this document is the addition of class 2A and class 2B recommendations. So we moved away from a world in which it's a yes, no approach to sport. And if it's no, you're relegated to those five games that I showed you earlier. These class 2A and class 2B recommendations state for many diseases that it may be reasonable to play even in the face of these established diagnoses. Importantly though, that there's still not a single class 1A recommendation, which is really an indication of the fact that there's a lot of work to be done with respect to um, rigorous data collection and randomized controlled clinical trials in this population. But here are some examples of the class two recommendations. And so in total, there are 412 class 2A or 2B recommendations in this document. Um, there are things including anomalous coronary arteries, athletes with ICDs, athletes with left ventricular non-compaction, athletes with revascularized coronary disease, transplant recipients, and channelopathy patients. And all of these people now have some flexibility to work with their doctors to decide whether or not sports represent a reasonable step moving forward. Um, but the challenge is that, is that these recommendations that provide flexibility really necessitate a process. So how do we think about the, the process of medical decision-making? I suspect many of you are very familiar with this concept. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, there's the old gray-haired doctor who approaches the patient with a paternalistic approach. And this is straightforward. Doctors know best. Clearing athletes to play sport is our job, not the patient's choice. The process is simple and why make it complicated? On the other side of the spectrum, you have the athlete who's facing a new diagnosis and a potential major change in life, 
And they have a very different perspective. They say, look, you know, docs don't always know best, uh, specifically for me, because I'm a patient and patients are individuals, not something you can read about in a textbook. There are medical and non-medical things that factor into the way I live my life. And you know why we make this complex? Because it simply is. So the best way to bridge these two bookends, really the sweet spot here is the concept of shared decision-making. And you know, shared decision-making is by no means new to, to medicine or to cardiovascular care in general, but it is a relatively new approach to the care of competitive athletes. And it's one that we're still working hard to figure out. So a couple of years ago, myself, Mike Ackerman from the Mayo Clinic and Rachel Lambert from Yale put together a, a frame of mind decision piece for circulation, in which we talked about the, the importance of shifting away from paternalism to the use of shared decision making in the care of athletes. And this was followed by a really nice similar piece by Sarah Sabari and Charlene Day, who were both at Michigan at the time, in which they talked about the importance of challenging the paradigm of taking our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients and making them couch potatoes, that really exercise is probably of a benefit and probably safe in this patient population. Um, we've also been working hard not only to talk about the importance of shared decision making, but to develop tools for people to use in the clinic. And this is just one example of a practical algorithm for use in, in the athlete with newly diagnosed cardiovascular disease. It's a multi step process which involves confirming diagnostic, diagnostic accuracy, making certain that risk stratification and treatment is optimized, patient and family education, really understanding patients' preferences and values synthesizing all of this into a decision that the patient and the clinician both feel comfortable with. And then importantly, engaging other stakeholders in the lives of the athletes. And this includes family members, this includes friends, this includes coaches, this includes educators, administrators, because it's really this that leads to the implementation of a decision and appropriate long-term follow-up. But I'll be the first to admit that we have no idea what the impact of shared decision making will be. Um, the pros and cons are completely untested and remain 100% speculative. And, and this really needs to be studied and vetted to ensure that the benefits of being more permissive outweigh the risks. Um, this is where I, I hope the ORCA registry will, will start to fill this gap. I'll just tell you briefly about what the ORCA registry is. The ORCA registry stands for the Outcomes Registry for Cardiac Conditions and Athletes. Uh, it is being run by a, a partnership between myself and, and other colleagues at Mass General and sports medicine physicians at the University of Washington, Don Dresden and Kim Harmon, with support both from the AMSSM and, and the American Heart Association and a, a large steering committee of, of, of similar experts from around the country. We started ORCA early in the COVID-19 pandemic with a very specific goal, and that was to understand what happens to young athletes who get, contract COVID and then come back to the college campus and try to play sports. So what we did in, in as quick a, a fashion as possible is got 42 different colleges and universities around the country to agree to participate in a prospective registry. Uh, this included 23 states, 14 athletic conferences. Uh, and most of these were big time power five schools that were interested in getting football and basketball up and running and wanted to do so with some data to guide them. So in a relatively short period of time, um, we were able to help welcome back just shy of 20,000 student athletes to campus of which about 20% of them had had COVID infection. Um, these men and women uh, all underwent, or the majority of them underwent the typical recommended evaluation, which at that point was the so-called triad test, which included a transthoracic echo and ECG and, and a single blood troponin test. And so what we were able to do is look at the prevalence of COVID myocarditis in this population, and also the prevalence of things that were picked up during COVID screening that had nothing to do with COVID. So as it relates to COVID, it turned out to be a pretty good news story. The vast, vast majority of athletes coming back after COVID infection were totally healthy and had nothing wrong with them. A small number, just shy of 5%, had some abnormality on testing. And after adjudication, less than 1% had either definitive, probable, or possible COVID heart. But for every one COVID heart we found, we found three young athletes that had some non-infectious cardiovascular problem. And these are people that we worry about. These are people with big aortic roots. These are people with hypertrophic disease, with non-compaction, with channelopathy. And so what this really means is that, and we knew this going into this, that we were going to find a lot of non-COVID stuff and we were going to want to come up with a way of figuring out what to do with these people. And so... Taking this one step further, when we looked at this cohort at a one-year follow-up time point, um, the news continued to be quite reassuring. Among all of the athletes, and again, there were 21 of them that had uh, what we thought to be definitive, probable or possible COVID myocarditis, um, all of them had returned to sport at some point and there had been no adverse outcomes. 
In the larger cohort of people that didn't have COVID heart, there were two adverse outcomes. There was one resuscitated sudden cardiac arrest, which had nothing to do with COVID. It was a case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there was one athlete that had a bout of atrial fibrillation shortly after COVID infection. So very low event rates, but a, a, a sizable number of men and women out there playing sports that have either genetic or congenital heart disease with risk still undefined. So ORCA is pivoting. ORCA has now moved away from COVID and, and it is a registry that has been designed for, for the US college population. Um, I show you this slide just to encourage any of you who see these athletes or have them come across your radar screen to encourage them to enroll or to reach out to us to enroll them. This will be a longitudinal prospective data capture of what happens to young kids with cardiovascular disease, uh, whether they remain eligible or not, for us to get some hard data about what risk and, and inclusion look like. So I want to leave um, the young athlete eligibility and share decision-making topic and introduce you to my, my friend and my patient, Ted. Uh, Ted is one of the most decorated um, aging oarsmen that I know of in the world. If there's an international regatta somewhere, Ted has won it. Uh, and he's done so with coronary disease of big aorta hypertension and atrial fibrillation. And he's been able to do this because he has made a commitment to not only continue to be an athlete, but to take good care of himself and follow the, the advice of, of sports cardiology. Um, Ted typifies a group of athletes that we call master's athletes. By definition, these are men and women above the, the age of 35 who exercise vigorously for at least five hours a week and, and in doing so place some emphasis on goals. Now their goals may be to compete against others or to compete against themselves, but they're out there with some sense of purpose and they push themselves hard. Um, about 10 years ago, there was an editorial published in the Wall Street Journal and it was posted online at 8.02 in the evening. Now I have no idea what I was doing that night, but I remember the next morning coming into work, I had 465 emails in my in basket asking what to make of this editorial. And the editorial was called One Running Shoe in the Grave. And the editorial basically goes on to say that running can take a toll on the heart that essentially eliminates the benefits of exercise. Running too far, too fast, and for too many years may speed one's progress for the finish line of life. Now, this was not an original thought for the, the, the journal editorialist. This was a, a summary of an editorial that was about to come out in the British Journal of Heart. Uh, and this is the editorial, Run for Your Life at a Comfortable Speed and Not Too Far published by Jim O'Keefe and Carl Lavi, two relatively well-known US-based cardiologists that I respect a, a great deal. And what they did in this editorial is they put forward um, several arguments, including a look at some old epi data, some new studies looking at cardiac damage in athletes, some case studies of athletes dropping dead, and, and, and pointed towards some new studies that were about to be published to make the argument that we can get too much of a good thing. Now, this was a journal commission, currently peer-reviewed article, um, that hasn't really stood up to the test of rigorous uh, review uh, now that many of us have read it. Uh, if you're interested in it, Jim does a great TED talk. I have the, the information there for you. It's worth watching. It's very entertaining. But most of the arguments in here are not per particularly um, strong. But, you know, one of the things I've learned in, in this field is that where there's a lot of smoke, there's usually a little bit of fire. So I think as responsible clinicians, it's reasonable for us to ask the question, does too much exercise over too much time hurt your heart? And I would say if it does so importantly, does it affect morbidity and mortality? And if so, what does this pathology look like? So why talk about this? There's reason to talk about this. There are some epidemiologic data that are now focusing on the high end of fitness, which show diminishing returns and people that push very high. There's lots of anecdotal observations of physically fit people dying during exercise. Perhaps it's due to some form of sport-induced cardiovascular disease. And there's observational data describing pathologic phenotypes among athletes and athletic patients. And, and maybe, just maybe, if you put all these things together, there's a syndrome of abnormalities that's perhaps caused by chronic exposure to high volume, high intensity exercise. So to, to talk about the exercise health outcomes relationship, I wanna just bring us back to early phase of our training where we learned about the dose response relationship. And we know that when we give an organism of any type uh, a stimulus, and the best example would be giving a patient a medication, that the, the response to that stimulus can be defined both by an efficacy curve and a toxicity curve. And when we do something that we hope helps someone, we think we want them to live in that margin of safety where they experience efficacy but avoid toxicity. We also know that when you apply the dose response principle to populations, there are people that, that buck the rules. We have benefit outliers, so people that get lots of benefit despite very low exposure and people that get no benefit despite toxic exposure. 
And we have toxicity outliers, people that develop toxic responses to stimuli at very low doses and those that can handle what should be toxic doses with, without any sequela. So how does dose response and exercise come together? Well, it's unfortunately a little more complicated and there are different curves that can be applied based on what outcome you're talking about. So curve A, which is the straight linear curve, that's actually a reasonable approximation of the relationship between exercise, dose, and athletic performance. Typically, the more you train up to a very, very high level, the better you perform in the race. Curve B, the asymptotic curve, is a, is a nice depiction of the relationship between exercise and modification or attenuation of cardiovascular risk factors. If you go from doing nothing to something, you will improve blood pressure, you will improve plasma lipoproteins, you will reduce inflammation. But at a certain point, you get really no more bang for your buck. And that's probably at about two to three times physical activity uh, recommendations. So maybe 300 to 450 minutes per week. The bimodal distribution curve shown in the bottom right of your screen represents the complex relationship between exercise and weight loss. If you go from doing nothing to something, you will stimulate some weight loss, but it really takes a fair bit of exercise to stimulate meaningful long-term weight loss. And again, that's somewhere approximately two times physical activity recommendations. And then of course, curve C, which is my favorite and the most feared is the relationship between exercise dose and, and marital success. If you're not home on the weekends because you're out riding your bike the whole time, your spouse is probably not gonna like you too much. So thinking about exercise and longevity, the first question to ask is do elite level athletes live longer than the rest of us? And the answer is probably yes. Um, many European countries that have socialized medical systems have the ability to capture with precision um, long-term events in, in, in their population. And this is one example of a study that comes out of such, such a situation. These are data from Finland in which elite level Finnish athletes were followed throughout a lifetime. And these are survival curves. And what you can see here is that there are separation in the survival curves that begin at approximately the fourth or fifth decade of life. It's easier to, to see this story if you look at the numbers. And so what is done here is the, 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 the mean longevity of endurance sport athletes, team sport athletes, and power sport athletes are compared to sedentary reference controls. And you can see that the endurance sport athletes enjoy roughly five to seven years of longer life than reference. Team sport athletes anywhere from one to five years more of life. And interestingly, power athletes, so people that push high loads, do a lot of weightlifting, appear to have no mortality benefit at all. Um, it's not just how long you live, it's also whether you end up in the hospital. And again, these are data coming from Finland. I highlight here ischemic heart disease, but there are other non-cardiovascular problems that follow suit. And again, the story is a pretty compelling one, that if you were an elite level athlete at a young age, you were less likely to end up in the hospital if you were an endurance athlete or a mixed sport athlete. Um, however, these men and women that do these power sports, and this is an area that we're actively looking at and have been for some time, they appear to be at higher risk for ischemic heart disease. And this is etiologically something that uh, still remains somewhat unclear, but the signal has been, been there in lots of different data sets. So it was once thought that exercise was so good that maybe it did confer complete immunity from cardiovascular disease, specifically atherosclerosis. This is a very famous paper written by the California pathologist Thomas J. Bassler, in which he looked at autopsy series, an autopsy series of marathon runners who died from traumatic causes and put forth the concept that if you were capable of running 26.2 miles or 42 kilometers, as we define it here in Europe, that your coronaries would be free from atherosclerosis, that there is a certain level of exercise that simply cures you of this disease. And gosh, I wish this were true, but it's simply not the case. You know, we confirmed this in definitive fashion with the RACER study, which is published in the journal now just more than a decade ago. This was a, a large case series of, of fatalities and aborted cardiac arrests in US-based marathons and half marathons. And indeed the most common cause of, of, of cardiac arrest and death, particularly in older athletes above the age of 35 or 40 was coronary artery disease. So this is a problem that's alive and well in that population. Why might that be the case? Well, um, some preliminary um, thoughts about that come from the Boston Master Study, which we did a number of years back. And this was just a, a community-based sampling of uh, several hundred men and women that participate in competitive organized athletics at the master's level in the greater Boston area. And we asked a bunch of different questions. The first was, are these people going to the doctor? And the answer is yes. And the second is when they go to the doctor, what happens? And the first answer is the doctors do a lot of tests. Most of them got some form of screening test. They got an ECG, they got a stress test, they got an echo. Increasingly, they were getting cardiac CT scan. 
And the doctors that were caring for them were not crazy. They weren't doing this uh, for no reason. They were doing this because they were detecting traditional athro risk factors. So family history of, of coronary disease, ongoing or prior tobacco use, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and even in some cases, obesity. And what was really interesting about this data set is that only approximately 30% of these athletes, and these are the healthiest looking people in our community, were truly risk factor free. About a third of them had one risk factor, about another third had multiple risk factors, and close to 10% of them had established cardiovascular disease, which was almost all attributed to coronary disease or arrhythmia, which was primarily atrial fibrillation. However, the sobering thing that we learned from this study is that 40% of these folks felt dismissed or mistreated when they went to the doctor because of the fact that they identified themselves as an athlete. And what this looks like in clinical practice is the patient walking in and, and telling the doctor that they were concerned because their five mile pace had dropped off or they're concerned because their marathon time had dropped a few minutes. And the doctor looked at them and looked out in the waiting room and said, you are the least deserving of my time right now. I don't need to bother with you because you can still run and move along. And the, the important message here is that when athletic people come to us with concerns, uh, as, as trivial as they may seem, they often know their body better than we do. And it's important to take them seriously and look underneath the hood. So what I want to do in the last 15, 20 minutes or so here is talk about the four most common disease processes that we deal with in, in aging people. And I want to ask a causal question. And that is, I want to ask the question, do endurance sport which is the most common form of organized sport and aging athletes, cause or contribute to these problems. So we're gonna talk about arrhythmia, we're gonna talk about heart muscle problems, we're gonna talk about the enlarged aorta, and finally we'll, we'll wrap it up with coronary disease. So um, this is a 52 year old marathoner with decreased exercise tolerance. This is a dime a dozen in a sports cardiology practice. Um, and this is no diagnostic dilemma. This is atrial fibrillation. And then again, this is something that if you work with this patient population, you will see over and over again. There have now been a number of well-done observational case control studies, which all have reached the same conclusion. And that is that men and women who push their bodies hard into the second half of life are at increased risk for atrial top arrhythmia, specifically fib and flutter. This has been a consistent finding. Perhaps the, the most instructive of these, again, uh, emerging from, from Northern Europe, this time Sweden, not Finland, is the so-called Vosilopic study, in which more than 50,000 men and women that participated on, on an annual basis in the Vosilopic, which is a 90 kilometer mode of ski race, were followed for the development of incident arrhythmia. And what the investigators did is they used two measures of exercise intensity and duration surrogate. They used the race time, meaning the faster one race, the harder they typically pushed. And they used the number of races that occurred over the study period, which is a surrogate for exercise dedication and total exercise dose. And whether they looked at finishing time or number of times these people came to the race, the story was still the same and that more exercise with more intensity and more frequency led to a, a higher incidence of arrhythmia. And this was almost exclusively explained, explained by atrial fibrillation. So why do athletes get AFib? Well, the, the classic and much oversimplified explanation is that it's a function of left atrial remodeling. We know that in athletes uh, who exercise habitually over long periods of time, that a significant number of them will develop left, left atrial dilation. Um, this is, however, not a particularly robust marker of who gets fib or not. It's a much more complicated cascade. It does involve some dilation, but probably more importantly, fibrotic remodeling. There are also important neurologic ch changes that occur in the trained athlete, persistent vagotonia, sympathetic surges during exercise, intermittent left atrial hypertension, chronic inflammation, genetics, alcohol, caffeine, psychosocial stress. So a very complicated milieu of things that contribute to the, the higher prevalence of AFib in this population. What is clear is that the strongest association between sport and any acquired pathology is fit. There's, there's no longer any debate about this, and that is that men and women that push hard uh, are at increased risk of this problem. And, and what I would like to impress upon you is that our, our ability to treat them in a data-driven fashion is very limited simply because we have very few appropriate data. So you're, you're all sitting there saying to yourself, this, this guy from Boston or Switzerland, or the heck he is from uh, is crazy, right? We have the AFFIRM trial, which taught us that rate control and rhythm control are equivalent. So take your pick, let your patient choose, no problem. We have great scores to predict bleeding. We have great scores to predict clot. And we now have lots of different ways to treat people. We have medications, we have catheters. So this is not that complicated disease. I would challenge you in applying any of these to the athletic patient. And let's just talk about some examples. So what about rhythm control and rate control? If you go with rate control, you will hear things like rate control ruined my life. 
the quickest way to never see a patient like this is to put them on a high dose beta blocker and anticoagulant and send them out the door. They simply won't like it and they'll find another doctor. What about the bleeding versus clot balance in atrial fibrillation? These are great tools. I use them. I'm not saying that they're not applicable, but we have to think about them with a little bit of equipoise because the truth is, is that for scores like this really made for people like me and the answer is not. And I think the real challenge is in the chats two vast ones and twos where the risk of bleeding is actually higher than the general population. We have to think about that and talk about creative strategies to reduce stroke risk, but also protect them. And then finally, catheter ablation. I love ablation. I refer many patients for ablation and I have had good success, but there's a downside to ablation. And there's the downside to ablation is that sometimes athletes will come back after their procedure telling you they're, telling you they're cured of their arrhythmia, but not fixed and they wanna know why. And this is a function of too aggressive substrate modification. An effective ablation that definitively cures AFib sometimes generates so much scar in the atrium that it becomes porcinalized. And while this may keep atrial fibrillation away for the duration of life, it reduces the atrium's ability to function and doing so reduces the athlete's ability to generate high cardiac output. They lose their stroke volume kick. And so while they're in sinus, they don't feel good. So I just think we need a lot more to learn about when and how to apply anti-arrhythmic therapy, both medications and catheters in, in this patient population. What about cardiomyopathy? This is a really interesting story. Um, early on in my time in Boston, I put together something called the Harvard Athlete Initiative where we simply leverage the, uh, the option of having so many fit athletes uh, within a mile or two of our campus. And we got a lot of these men and women to do studies for us. And one of the first studies we did was, was a look at uh, myocardial strain mechanics, so contractile function. And we did a study in which we took young rowers who were fresh to college, who were gonna see the highest training rate they ever had in their life. We wanted to ask the simple question, does training change strain? And so indeed, we did this pre and post strain measurement study in which 20 men went out and rode hard for a couple of months. We imaged them beforehand, afterhand, and we generated strain maps. And what was not surprising is that contractile function at rest got better in most areas. So in the longitudinal vector, it was better. In the radial vector, it was better. But there was a strange finding in the interventricular septum when we looked in the circumferential vector, and that there, and that there, was, there, there was a significant and consistent drop in function in all of these young men. And it wasn't really clear what was going on here, but there was a hint, and that is that the amount of strain reduction, we can think of this as septal fatigue, was highly correlated with how big their right ventricles got. So it was, I think, the first example or the first description of ventricular interdependence in the concept of physiologic or adaptive remodeling. So what, it, what we were seeing is that the right heart was affecting a portion of the left heart. Now, when we published this study, we had no idea what to make of this. We simply wrote in the discussion that the clinical relevance was uncertain, that more follow-up studies needed to be done. Uh, fast forward a few years later, I got a call from the British physiologist by the name of Greg White, we had a small series of athletes that he had put through the MR scanner and he found non-ischemic fibrosis by LGE imaging in the septum of these athletes. And he thought to himself, well, maybe that fatigue signal that those Boston people reported, if persistent over many years, uh, over many decades, maybe that could cause scar. And that was a nice setup for the, the important study by Andre Regersh and colleagues that I'm gonna share with you now. So what Andre did is he, he recruited 40 uh, incredibly fit athletes. These were people that were pushing hard, that were competitive, that were free of cardiac symptoms, that had no traditional risk factors. He was able to really confirm that their hearts were healthy by putting them through an aggressive stress echo protocol. And then he went on to do a, a series of measurements. He did MRIs, echoes, and, and phlebotomized them at three time points before a big race, after a big race, and then after a week or two of recovery. Who did he recruit? These were marathon runners, triathletes, cyclists, ultra distance athletes. And, and the most important part of, of the table one in athlete studies is, is to look at, at measurements of fitness. And you can see here a third line from the bottom that their percent predicted VO2 max was in the 140 to 155 range. So these were truly elite level competitors. He got the right people to ask the right question. What did he find? Well, he found that when these men and women went out and raced, that there were physiologic changes. At the end of the race, their heart rates were up, their blood pressure, both in the systemic and pulmonary circulatory systems were down. But interestingly, their right hearts looked really tired, regardless of how the right heart was imaged, whether it was with echo or with MRI, the right heart looked tired after a race. But good news was that a week or two later, all of the function appeared to improve. 
Um, this is the schematic that explains the physiology um, as the right ventricle experiences high, high blood flow and feels pulmonary vascular resistance. It tends to fatigue because it's not as adept at handling that as the left ventricle. There's dilation, there's bowing of the interventricular uh, septum at the expense of the left ventricle. And what this does is it translates into a high level of stress across that septum, particularly at the RV insertion hinge points. Um, and somewhat soberingly, when the MRIs were analyzed from these 40 people, five out of the 40 of them had non-ischemic fibrotic patterns in this exact region. Um, some intramyocardial scar, some confined just to the artery insertion hinge points, but these were healthy people at the top of their game and had hearts that looked like this. So why might this happen? Well, it's more complicated than just doing a lot of exercise, at least in my opinion. It does involve a lot of exercise, so chronic extreme volume and intensity, there's almost definitely some element of training recovery mismatch, meaning not resting and recovering enough. There's probably something at the genetic level that confers host susceptibility, and it's not ARVC genes. Those have been vetted. But probably most importantly, there's got to be a secondary process, use of some performance-enhancing drugs, some occult infection, or maybe something as simple as unrecognized garden variety cardiovascular disease like hypertension. And if, in fact, this happens, the perfect storm may exist and, and your heart may look like this. But I just want to leave you with what I think is the, the, the way to think about this with some equipoise, and that is, although there are some data sets that show this pachyfibrosis in elite level athletes, there's never been any good clinical correlate of this. There's never been anything to show definitively that this leads to heart failure or the malignant arrhythmias. So it's a finding at this point that's really of, of no clear clinical relevance. What about aortopathy? This is a really interesting story. There um, have been some, some large cross-sectional data sets looking at aortic dimensions in young competitive athletes uh, that have reached the conclusion that aortic dilation among people that perform sport um, is very uncommon. So less than 2% of athletes um, who are men will have an aorta above 39. Less than 1% of women above the uh, women will have an aorta above the cut point of 33. And so the thinking has been that, that the aorta is relatively immune to the hemodynamics effects of sports. Um, what the aorta does reflect, as most of you know, is simply body size and, and height being the most important determinant of that. So that's an important factor when we're looking at aortas in young, healthy people. Um, a meta-analysis pushed this, um, this concept a little bit and said, you know, maybe clinically relevant aortic dilation is not that common in athletes, but athletes do have larger aortas than sedentary controls, and they do so by several millimeters depending on where you measure it. Um, and what dictates which athletes? Well, it tends to be men more than women, and it tends to be endurance athletes more than strength athletes. So something about the volume loading of the endurance athlete, particularly the male athlete, seems to confer a signal toward aortic dilation. Um, we saw different things in clinic for a long time. And that is, we saw a lot of master's athletes that came in that had big aortas and were sent by doctors that were appropriately concerned. And so we set out to do a, a study looking prospectively to, to measure the prevalence of, of clinically relevant aortic dilation in aging athletes. And so enrolled high level athletes, rowers that were qualified for the Boston Marathon, sorry, rowers that were qualified for the National Senior Regatta, and runners that were qualified for the Boston Marathon, got a lot of information about them and went and measured the aorta. And what we found is that um, there was a lot of dilation. So upwards of 25% of men had sinus measurements that were greater than 40. Um, upwards of 20% of men had a, a ascending aortas that were greater than 40. And similar percentages of dilation were, were, uh, were observed in, in the females, particularly if we use gender-specific cut points. Um, we also, I think, start to see that not all parts of the aorta are created equal. Um, sinus dilation was a function of, of body size, gender, and the type of sport, whereas aortic dilation in the ascending aorta was largely driven by hypertension. So it may very well be that there's, there's mixed physiology here. Um, what does it mean? Stay tuned. Um, all of these men and women are, are now engaged in a longitudinal surveillance registry where they're getting serial aortic measurements and they're being followed for, for, the, for instant aortic, acute aortic syndromes and the need for aortic surgery. So we'll hopefully be able to show one way or another that this is either adaptive or pathologic. My sense is it's going to be largely a benign phenotype, but that the data are still to come. So finally, my favorite one, and that's coronary artery disease. And this has been a, a topic of, of quite a bit of debate. So I don't think I need to remind this audience that exercise does good things for traditional risk factors, whether we're talking about hypertension, abdominal adiposity, plasma lipoproteins, superb exercise intervention studies have shown that when you exercise, you move these things in the right direction. 
And in fact, work done by some of my Boston-based colleagues, Sami Mora and Iman Lee, show that even when we account for all of the known things that exercise does, we can only really explain about 60% of the longevity benefit that physically fit people get. There's something undescribed, probably something at the molecular level that makes exercise good for us that we still have yet to explain. So where does a study like this come from? Running the risk of coronary events. This is a German study that was published in the European Heart Journal about 15 years ago, in which the, the authors put uh, accomplished marathon runners through the CT scanner and measured coronary calcium. And what they were able to show is that marathon runners compared to age match controls, and probably more importantly, compared to age and risk factor match controls, tended to have more coronary calcium than their sedentary counterparts. Um, and that some of these men with high CAC scores went on to have problems. So this was a wake-up call, and that is maybe if you run a lot, you injure your corner of and in doing so, put yourself at risk for the, for the outcomes that we as cardiologists care about. Uh, a second study, this time based in the U.S., published in Missouri Medicine, which I must admit I don't read routinely, but this study did catch my attention. This is a study called Increased Coronary Plaque Volume Among Marathon Runners, and, and this group of investigators enrolled a sizable cohort of marathon runners that had participated in the Twin Cities Marathon over 25 consecutive years. So a lot we don't know about these guys. We know nothing about how, how much they train, how they did in the race, what their exercise physiology was. But what we do know is that they tended to have more plaque in their coronary arteries, both calcified and non-calcified in the selective control group. So what do you do with these two studies? Well, you have several interpretation options. Option one is that high levels of exercise cause atherosclerosis. Option two is that traditional risk factors are causal and they're just underappreciated. Or option three, and perhaps the most intriguing, is that coronary disease may be driven by unknown or unmeasured risk factors, and maybe coronary plaque, specifically coronary calcium, is a slightly different beast in people that are fit and otherwise healthy. So let's go back to these two studies and look a little bit deeper under the hood and ask ourselves whether we think running was the cause of these men's coronary atherosclerotic burdens. So the four men in the German study that went on to have problems, and these were important problems. You can see here, if you look at the bottom, that these were accomplished marathon runners. One guy ran 14, one 22, one 65, and one guy ran 140 marathons. And they had ventricular tachycardia requiring for coronary stenting, stent cabbage, stent BT during exercise that necessitated cabbage after an ischemic workout. But the interesting thing is why. And so, again, the simple thing is to say that they got into trouble because they ran too much. But if you look carefully at their risk factor profile, runner one had a total cholesterol of 344 and was a former smoker. Runner two was a medicated hypertensive. Runners three and four were both former smokers with high blood pressure. They were not on medication. So, again, do you really think that it was the running that caused these men's coronary disease? I would submit it probably wasn't. What about the Missouri Medicine Study? This is really interesting. I, I'm not sure how they were able to find 50 guys who ran 25 consecutive marathons, of which more than half were either active or former smokers. But in, indeed, they were able to do that. And although it wasn't statistically significant, it was more smoking than it was in the control group. But the, the important thing about this study is not what they measured, but what they failed to measure. And what they failed to measure is not their fault. They're just hard things to measure that are important when we talk about causality. The first is diet. I would remind you that fit people that burn a lot of calories oftentimes treat poor macronutrients, treat unhealthy foods because they can get away with it. And while they may look fit and have a six pack, they almost certainly have the atherosclerotic sequela of eating a bad diet. There's the concept of the carefree 20s and 30s in which aging athletes actually live relatively unhealthy lives until some point in which they woke up and wanted to turn things around. And while this is, this is certainly something we should support, when and if they get sick, it's important that our medical history reflects earlier life exposure risk factors. And finally, family genetics. They're never controlled for in this study. And if I have one question, I ask my, my athletic patients about um, when I'm trying to, dis to discern future after risk, it's what happened to mom and dad. And you know, without controlling for any of these, we really can't say anything about causality. So to bring this all home, I want to take you up to, to, to Mount Washington or in New Hampshire. They have a road race there that I uh, really enjoy running and every year I can get up there. And I typically will bring our sports cardiology fellows up there, not force them to run, but simply encourage them to listen and, and, and learn about the distance running community. And one time I was up there, there was a conversation that uh, a fellow and I overheard standing in line for the quarter potty getting ready for the race. I wish I had the ability to record it, but I couldn't. But this is what the conversation signed with. The first guy, four men standing in line. The first guy says, man, not so sure that second plate of chili nachos in the extra couple of years last night were such a good idea. Oh, well, they always say don't change your routine prior to races. 
This is an issue of poor dietary choices. Runner two, just wish my old man could see me now. He died at age 45 from a massive heart attack. Glad I got my wake up call, bad stuff runs in my family. Now, we wanna support this athlete because he's understanding genetic risk, but when he ends up on your cat table with a fresh LED, take the time to ask him about his family history before you tell him that it was the running that got him into trouble. What about this one? Well, regardless of what happens, I've got to be better off than I was 20 years ago when I was smoking the pack a day and got short of breath just driving up this damn hill. Again, this is an individual trying to turn around risk factor profile and doing good things later in life. But if and when this person gets sick, let's not blame it on the exercise, but let's think about the risk factors that may have contributed prior to this life change. And then finally, the best one, particularly now that we know what we know about COVID, cough, 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 sputter. If this race was only once a year, I'd be home in bed. I feel like shit. Oh, well, this little climb will help me clear out the junk. So this is perhaps the most concerning because as most of you know, when we are infected by virus, uh, even if we only feel it in our noise and our oral pharynx, there's low grade inflammation all through the vascular tree and, and, and running and pushing hard or pushing hard in any form of physical exertion during a virus is a perfect setup for plaque rupture. So we just got to again remember that running when we're sick is not a particularly good idea. So is running really the causal issue? I would submit no, I would submit it's the risk factors that runners and other aging athletes bring to the sport that causes them to develop and, and suffer from coronary sequela, not the exercise itself. So to finish this up and, and wrap all these concepts together, let's go back to the dose response curve and let's make sense of this. Uh, I think without a shed of doubt that the vast majority of recreational and competitive athletes will live in this margin of safety and will enjoy a lot of the benefit of exercise without having any toxicity. Coronary disease lives in this population and in my synthesis of the literature and my clinical experience is not that it's caused by sport, but that it's precipitated by traditional risk factors that we all appreciate and can do something about it or on top of them. Atrial fibrillation in, in contrast is the best example of overuse pathology. This is clearly related to the level of exercise in the second half of life. And I've tried to press upon you earlier that the real future goal is to come up with data driven treatment paradigms in this population and not rely solely on what we do in the general more sedentary folks. Um, aortic dilation is a stay tuned um, story. We know it's more common in people that are fit through age and doing endurance sports. Um, the degree to which it infers susceptibility to acute aortic syndromes has yet to be determined and hopefully will be answered in, in the relatively near future. And then finally, toxic exposure cardiomyopathy or this fibrosis. Uh, I would pay little attention to this at this point. I think one study has suggested that it might happen. Several studies have tried and have failed to reproduce, and it's not something that we see coming with a lot of clinical sequela in day to day practice. So finally, um, thinking more broadly about exercise uh, as it relates to the care of patients, not just athletic patients, um, I think we should all be moving in a direction which we talk to every single patient we encounter at every single visit about physical activity. If you don't assess physical activity, you don't understand it, you miss opportunities to intervene. And when you ask patients about how much physical activity they do, you can conveniently put them into one of three groups. The red group, which are patients that fail to meet physical activity guidelines, which I'll remind you are 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity or 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity a week, and there's opportunity to intervene and change and make them healthy. In the rare people that do just the right thing, positive reinforcement and encouraging them to stick with it over the years and care for them can go a long way. And then, of course, we've been spending the most of the last hour talking about these people in the yellow group who decide and choose to exercise at very high levels in which there's a lot of opportunity to discuss um, steps and, and tricks to keep them safe, safe and healthy and to keep them going even after they develop heart disease. So with that, I'll conclude and thank you greatly for your attention. And again, I really appreciate the, appreciate the invitation to be with you. Thanks so much, Dr. Bagish. That was a great talk. Uh, if anyone in the audience has a question, please leave it in the chat or feel free to raise your hand. It looks like we have a question from Dr. Evelyn Stock. Dr. Stock, did you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Otherwise, I can go ahead and ask on your behalf. Uh, <clears throat> sure, Layla. Thank you. Um, hi, Aaron. Uh, thank you for such a great um talk about this very important topic. I have a very uh, general cardiology question for you. Um, we often have patients who have Disney on exertion, we put them on a treadmill, and we find a hypertensive response to exercise. Um, what is your, uh, what are your thoughts about this? And how do you manage this? Well, first, hi, Evelyn. It's nice to see you. I would say for the most part, an overwhelming majority of patients that have a hypertensive response to exercise 
actually have undiagnosed resting hypertension and we just need to go looking for it. I have a very, very low threshold to ask people who have a blood pressure response on the treadmill to do surveillance. And I would say 19 times out of 20, they come back with readings which reflect true hypertension and, and then they need to be treated either with lifestyle modification first and foremost, but oftentimes with medication because it's the real deal and the treadmill oftentimes helps us find it. Great. So um, you don't do anything other than treat the hypertension. Well, we start with the, the simple lifestyle things first, right? If you can get alcohol and caffeine intake down, mm -hmm. if you can get salt out of their diet, that can actually make a big difference. Um, but many athletes have genetically predetermined hypertension, just like non-athletes and their pharmacotherapy with, with a vasodilator, an ACE inhibitor, or a calcium channel blocker can be very effective. Thank you. And then there's another question from Dr. Nora Goldschlager. Dr. Goldschlager, did you want to unmute yourself to ask? I just wanted to know, Erin, if um, there's information on actual COD in those who have cardiac arrest or other deaths. How much of this is arrhythmic? Do we know anything? Well, I'm sorry. Tell me what you mean by COD. Cause of death. Oh, cause of death. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is interesting. I'm really glad you brought that up. So the, the, the old school thinking about cardiac arrest etiology, particularly in young, healthy people, is that it was all attributable to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That data was, was faulty. It was based on very biased uh, selection bias registry data. Contemporary autopsy series show that about a third of young people that die during exercise have nothing discernibly structurally wrong with their heart and even nothing with a good genetic autopsy to, uh, to explain their cause of death. Certainly congenital and genetic structural problems are big players, um, but there's an increasing recognition of the fact that sudden unexplained death with the acronym SUD is more common than they previously recognized, which is a sobering thing for those of us that work in this field. Great. And then we have a question from uh, Dr. Nisha Parikh. She is wondering if there is any association between HIT training uh, and the cardiovascular disease outcomes you mentioned, like AFib, for example. Yeah, that's a great question. So HIT or high intensity interval training is the, is the buzzword, both in the exercise circles as well as in cardiac rehab. Um, I think it's a, it's a question that still remains somewhat unanswered. Most of the HIT data would suggest that it's probably just as safe as steady state moderate intensity activity, even among patients with high risk coronary anatomy and patients with ventricular arrhythmias. Um, the degree to which it actually improves outcomes above and beyond traditional rehab approaches, I think it is still an unanswered question, but I think, I, I know a number of groups are working on this, so I think we're probably two to three years out from some good data in that space. I had a quick question, Dr. Bagish, as well. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how your counseling returned to play after COVID. It looked like in the ACC guidelines, you had mentioned that for post-myocarditis, um, it, it, there's actually sort of the intense series of tests that um, competitive athletes are supposed to do. Like they're supposed to get an echo, a Holter monitor, an exercise EKG test six months after their illness. And so I was wondering if for competitive athletes who get COVID, you're recommending the same thing or how you counsel them? Yeah, I wish I had another hour to answer that question. So we've learned so much about COVID uh, and moved from a state of complete alarm and fear of COVID myocarditis to one in which we, we now recognize that it's much, much less common than we're led to believe. So in the evaluation of the athlete after COVID infection, it boils down to the discussion about the nature of infection. And people that just had generalized systemic illness uh, are typically okay to get back into sports once they feel better without any testing. For athletes that had um, moderate to severe disease or those that had any true cardiopulmonary symptoms during, um, the recommendation is still to perform a triad test, which would include an echo, an ECG, and a spot troponin test. Although I'll tell you our, our data on troponin would suggest that it's a pretty useless addition. So you can get by with just an ECG and an echo in patients that have at least intermediate pretest probability of cardiac involvement. Thank you, that makes sense. Any other questions that we have from the audience? Feel free to just unmute yourself and ask as well if you have a question. I have another question about um, a specific patient on how you go about distinguishing um, athletic heart from um, cardiomyopathy. I have a 40-year-old, a very avid athlete um, who has a family history. His father had died of um, heart failure. 
dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, I just saw him a few weeks ago, and he has biatrial enlargement and gets paroxysmal AFib. And his BNP is elevated to about twice the upper limit of normal. So I'm wondering how you would work that up. And it seems more cardiomyopathy than exercise induced, but just wanted your thoughts. Yeah, Evelyn, it's another really good question. It's one without a perfect answer. The concept of evaluating the patient with, with gray zone um, structural abnormalities, and there are, are four principal ones, thick walls, dilated LV chamber, dilated RV chamber, and, and trabeculate apices. Um, is tricky business. Um, in the most recent imaging guidelines, we put forth uh, a suggested approach, which integrates a whole bunch of things, clinical and family history, as you alluded to, findings on imaging, findings on ambulatory rhythm monitoring. And so I think what you do is you stack up all of the things you have and you make a tough decision one way or another, transparently admitting to the patient that you can't be sure. Um, and then you stick with that. And importantly, you follow the patient closely over time and help them make whatever decisions you think are best for them and they think are best for themselves about what to do with that information. But it remains the million dollar sports cardiology question. When someone comes up with a gold standard diagnostic discriminating test for adaptive versus pathologic hypertrophy, we will all be in a much easier world. All right. Well, thanks, Dr. Bagish, again for a fantastic talk. We'll have a recording um, of this talk available on our division's YouTube page. And for the audience next week, we're not going to be having grand rounds because of faculty retreat. So we're going to be resuming the following Wednesday on October 26th. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. And thank you, Dr. Bagish, again.